There we go. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to continue our study going through the book of Ephesians. And this morning we're particularly going to look at verses 20 to 32. But let's start at verse 17 just to get the, the full context of this section. <laughs> Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of the heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But you did not, that, that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you had heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, that is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry, and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Let us pray. Father, we pray that as we consider these ethical exhortations in light of our being justified by faith in Christ alone, having our union with Christ, we pray that you would be at work in our lives, developing these, enhancing them, working in us uh, greater Christian character. In Jesus' name, amen. For Palm Sunday and Easter, we begin looking at this important ethical passage and section in the book of Ephesians. We observe that it's important to remember that these ethical exhortations are given in the context that we are redeemed people who are called to live worthy for the calling with which we have been called. Our Christian living is not a mere moralism, but flows out of our redemption is empowered by the grace of God. We also noted that these ethical exhortations contain a negative and a positive approach. Verses 17 uh, through 20 present the idea from a negative perspective, don't be like this. And then the next section gives positive exhortations. Uh, put off these things, put on these characteristics. And again, it is very important to think about any ethical command in Scripture in light of the fact that we are redeemed people. We are people who have been justified through faith in Jesus, who are adopted into His family, belong to Him, and the Holy Spirit indwells us and is at work in our lives. Basically, we are to affirm in this section, essentially, who we are in Christ and live accordingly. We are to live in accordance with who we are in Christ, in union with Him. Here it is said that we learn to Christ in verse 20, but that is not the way you learned Christ. It is not merely learning about Him or His doctrines, that can be included, but we have learned Christ Himself. Uh, Charles Hodge, in 
his very well done commentary in Ephesians says, But as the Scriptures speak of preaching Christ, which does not mean merely to preach His doctrines, but to preach Christ Himself, to set Him forth as the object of supreme love and confidence, so to learn Christ does not mean merely to learn His doctrines, but to attain the knowledge of Christ as the Son of God, God in our nature, the Holy One of God, the Savior from sin, and to know uh, is holiness and life, whom to know is holiness and life. Anyone who has thus learned Christ cannot live in darkness and sin. Such knowledge is in the very nature light. Where it enters, the mind is irradiated, refined, and purified. You can see he overlaps learning doctrines about Christ with knowing the sweetness and the person himself. <laughs> To hear Him is not only to perceive Him with the outward ear, but to receive Him with an understanding heart, a heart that only comes as a result of the regenerating work of God. And this is contrasted with the futility of mind, uh, mind of darkness and understanding and hardness of the heart that's ascribed to the Gentiles in verses 17 and 18 the unbelievers. Um, uh, the particle, a gay, if indeed, does not express doubt, but the idea I take it for granted. Paul assumes that they are obedient to the truth of Christ. Uh, the concept of truth in this verse refers not to the idea of just moral truth or moral excellence, the principle Paul sets forth is that the knowledge of God in Christ is inconsistent with a life of sin, because this knowledge of truth is a holy truth, a moral excellence that is in Christ. In verses 22 and 24 addresses the old nature and the new nature. Verse 22 through 24 really, to, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Uh, there's a technical point in this that I think is important to mention concerning these concepts. Uh, some translations translate the two verses with an imperative idea, uh, that is, commands, uh, uh, you are now to put off the old nature uh, and put on the new. Uh, while it is true that infinities, which is what they are in Greek, can have an imperative idea, it's better theologically to see those infinities as infinities of the result. Uh, John Murray wrote extensively on this point. He points out, particularly from Romans 6, uh, because of the believer's spiritual union with Christ, the old nature is crucified, and that a radical cleavage with the power and dominion of sin has occurred. In fact, Romans 6, 5 states, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And of course, uh, in Ephesians 4, we see the same idea. Uh, the verbs are in uh, really emphasize that this is something that has occurred, it's taken place in the past. Murray comments on this passage, and he said, Paul is not exhorting believers to put off the old man and put on the new, like we still had the old and then put on the new. He is urging them to desist from certain sins, sins which are indeed characteristic of the old nature, the old man, and the reason he addresses their such abstinence is that they had put off the old man and put on the new man. Since this is the case, Paul is saying in effect, do not practice those sins which are after the pattern of the old nature, but behave as new men, as indeed you are. And the way he translates Ephesians uh, 4, uh, 20 to 24, but you have not so learned Christ if you have heard of Him and been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, 
so that you had put off according to the former manner of life the old man who is corrupted according to the lust of deceits and are being renewed in the spirit of your mind and have put on the new man who after God has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. Now, I mention this because in uh, some branches of dispensational theology, more the old line classic theology, uh, they'll argue that we have carnal Christians and spiritual Christians. And persons say they're a carnal Christian, they do whatever they want to do, sin all they want. Well, they're just a carnal Christian. I remember talking to someone one time and he was involved in just blatant adultery. And he said, well, you know, I'm just a carnal Christian. And uh, he held that theology. Uh, it's important to, to note that we do have a concern toward the Lordship of Christ in our lives. Uh, the old self is corrupt in accordance with the lust of deceit, as we saw in verse 22. Uh, Paul's statement in verse 20 that they do not so learn Christ indicates a strong contrast between what they once were and what they are now in Christ. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce makes the same point, and he wrote, this is an important point, the Apostle is not merely urging a new and higher standard of morality on people. That is an utterly futile thing. Well, you couldn't say that strongly enough. We cannot be genuinely better by mere moral persuasion. That is not it at all. Rather, Paul is demanding a high form of behavior precisely because something decisive has already taken place. We have already been made new in Christ. That is why we should and must act like it. Well, after this point being set forth, he then gives some specific ethical commands for the Christian life. Verse 25 starts with, therefore, based on who we are in Christ. Therefore, having put, on, uh, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor for we are members one of another. Uh, we're to lay aside falsehood and speak the truth. We're to be a truthful people. Uh, we're not to lie against our neighbor. We can uh, lie and slander deliberately or by innuendo. Uh, for example, the kind of the jo story, joke story is told about the first mate on a cargo ship that wrote in the log, Captain sober today. <laughs> well, it could imply the captain was drunk on the other days. <laughs> we are also to put off unrighteous anger. Verses 26 and 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Uh, the statement uh, does not have an expressed positive side, but we are probably to understand it as uh, the be angry command to having controlled righteous indignation rather than selfish, sinful anger. Anger in itself is not necessarily sinful. There is such a thing as righteous anger. God is depicted in Scripture as having an anger or wrath against the sins of men. Jesus was angry when He came into the temple and saw the money changers in the courtyard. And he made a whip, turned over their tables, and drove them out of the temple. Most of our anger, however, is not righteous indignation. We are simply angry in the wrong way at the wrong time. Uh, sometimes our anger is due to pain or frustration. In fact, often when you're angry, look behind the anger for what's the pain involved in it. Often that's driving your anger. Read a very gripping illustration of someone talking about uncontrolled anger. Uh, Mary Garden told the story of a uh, time of uncontrolled rage in her life. She said, Sin makes the sinner unrecognizable. I experienced this once myself, and I remember it because it frightened me. I became an animal. This sinful experience occurred, as many do, around the occasion of the dinner party. 
It was a hot August afternoon. I was having 10 people over for dinner that evening. No one was giving me a bit of help. I was, of course, feeling like a victim, as everyone does in a hot kitchen on an August day. It's important to remember that the angry person's habit of self-justification is often connected to his habit of seeing himself as a victim. She adds that parenthetically. <laughs> I have been chopping, stirring, bending over the low flame, and all alone, alone. The oven's heat was my purgatory, my crucible. My mother and my children thought this was a good time for civil disobedience. <laughs> they positioned themselves in the car and refused to move until I took them swimming. Now my children were the tender ages at the time of Seven and Thor. My mother was 78. And except for her daily habit of verbal iron pumping, properly described as in therm, they leaned out in the horn, shouted my name out the window, well within the hearing of the neighbors, reminding me of my promise to take them to the pond. There are certain times when the popular cliche disgorges itself from the dull setting of other use and comes to life. And this was one of them. I lost it. I lost myself. I jumped on the hood of the car. I pounded on the windshield. I told my mother and my children that I was never ever going to take them anywhere and, and none of them were ever going to have one friend in any house of mine until the hour of their death, which I hoped was very soon. <laughs> I couldn't stop pounding on the windshield. Then a frightening thing happened and here's her metaphoric description, I became a huge bird, a carrion crow. My legs became hard stalks. My eyes were sharp and vicious. I developed a murderous beak. Greasy black feathers took the place of the arms. I flapped and flapped. I blotted out the sun's light with my flapping. Each time my beak landed near the victims, it seemed to be my fists on the windshield, but it was really my beak on their necks. I went back for more. The taste of blood entranced me. I wanted to peck and peck forever. I wanted to carry them off in my bloody beak and drop them on a rock where I could feed on their battered corpses till my bird stomach swelled. I had to be forced to get off the car and stop pounding the windshield. Even then, I didn't come back to myself. When I did, I was appalled. I realized I had genuinely frightened my children, mostly because they could no longer recognize me. My son said to me, I was scared because I didn't know who you were. I understand the deadly sin of anger. I was unrecognizable to myself and for a time to my son. Of course, we're admonished not to let the sun go down on our anger as well. Jonathan Edwards in his, I would say, my favorite book of his, perhaps, Charity and Its Fruits, he said, anger may be unsuitable and unchristian with respect to its measure. First, when it is immoderate in degree, anger may be far beyond what the case requires. And often it is so great as to put persons beyond the control of themselves, their passions being so violent that for the time they know not what they do and seem to be unable to direct and regulate either their feelings or conduct. But the degree of anger ought always to be regulated by the end of it and should never be suffered to rise any higher than so far as tends to the obtaining of the good ends which reason has proposed. Second, when it is immoderate in its continuance, it is a very simple thing for persons to be long angry. The wise man not only gives this injunction, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, but he adds that anger resteth in the bosom of fools in Ecclesiastes 7, 9. And says the apostle, be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down on your wrath. If anger be long continued, it soon degenerates into malice, 
So the weather of evil spreads faster than the weather of good. If the person allows himself long to hold anger toward another, he will quickly come to hate him. And so we find that actually is among those that retain a grudge in their hearts against others through week after week, month after month, and year after year. They do in the end truly hate the persons against whom they lay up anger, whether they own it or not. And this is a most dreadful sin in the eye of God. All therefore should be exceedingly careful how they suffer anger long to continue in their hearts. I think that's an important exhortation. We also see in verse 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Uh, we're not to steal, but basically work for a living. Uh, this verse is a very important verse economically. It's in strong opposition to socialism or communist ideas. The verse affirms private ownership. Let him who steals steal no longer. Let the thief no longer steal. You can't steal if people don't own something. In fact, you think in the Old Testament, the sacrificial system would be meaningless without private ownership of bringing something you own. In the Ten Commandments, you had the commandment not to steal. And you have the commandment not to covet, which presupposes private ownership. Heard a report this news report this week from uh, dealing with UCLA Medical School, where first year medical students in a class were instructed to do several things. Some of them, one was to get down on their knees and kiss the ground and thank Mama Earth or giving them life. But another one was they were all stand up and renounce the evil god of private ownership and capitalism. Now, at least on that, only about half the class stood up. But, you know, these are people, college educated, into medical school, doing these things. Well, you can't steal something if there's no private ownership. It also affirms the sanctity of labor and work. Uh, we are to labor with our hands, honest labor. It affirms in that as well the idea of the reciprocal wage for our labor because you work to have something. In other words, you get paid for your labor. And then it affirms a comp uh, principle of compassion and charity to those who are worthy of charitable help. <clears throat> now, you can think about subtle ways that people steal. I mean, we obviously know, you know, just taking something off the shelf, like we see people running out of stores of that nowadays. But there's also subtle theft. The story is told of the man who, his work habits impressed his co-workers. At the end of the day, one of the men said, Mike, you sure have been working hard? And he winked and said, I'm just fooling the boss. I've actually been carrying the same load of bricks up and down the stairs all day. <laughs> and uh, my father's furniture business, remember he got a call once from a woman who was supposed to get a washer and dryer and said, where is it? You said they were coming an hour ago. He said, well, they left an hour ago and you only live three blocks away. <laughs> and, uh, and he discovered when the delivery crew got back, they kept fishing poles and tackle in the truck so that if they happened to pass an inviting pond, they could just stop and fish for a while. I also remember another place in the warehouse, of course, furniture store is a place where they stored mattresses. And he went back looking for a particular item and found some of the employees sleeping on the mattress in the middle of the day. <laughs> and uh, of course, he told them they could go on home and sleep. <laughs> But uh, those are also ways that we can steal. We also see unwholesome talk, bad words. Verse 29, um, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Um, here's the idea of Again, harsh words, it could be coupled with anger. 
Greek word for unwholesomeness means rotten or corrupt. It's used to describe in other places fruit that's rotting. This command is closely related to the admonition, admonitions that James gives in James 3 concerning the tongue. Remember most of that chapter deals with uh, the tongue and the world of the evil that can come from it. For example in James chapter 3 verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, straining the whole body, staining the whole body and setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. In James 3, 9 and 10, with it we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. You can think about being in a church service and you're singing, praise God, hallelujah. And then on the way home you see somebody coming towards you with their car and your thought is, I believe this person is trying to kill me with their automobile. And so what's your reaction? Ah, you know, toward them. And so at the same mouth we bless God and curse men. In verse 13 of James 3, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct let him show his works, uh, by his works in meekness and wisdom. R.C. Sproul in commenting on verse 13 said, The gentleness of wisdom does not leave room through a tongue that is used as a rapier against other people. Again, the same section in this Jonathan Edwards book, that book by the way is an exposition of 1 Corinthians 13 taking each one of the various characteristics mentioned there of what love is and had sermons on them, sometimes multiple ones. He said, in him that exercises the Christian spirit as he ought, there will not be a passionate, rash or hasty expression or a bitter exasperated countenance or an error of violence in the talk of behavior. But on the contrary, the countenance and words and demeanor will all manifest the savor of peaceableness and calmness and gentleness. He may perhaps reprove his neighbor. This may clearly be his duty. But if he does, it will, not, it will be without impoliteness and without that severity that can tend only to exasperate. And though it may be with strength and reason and argument and with plain and decided expostulation, it will still be without angry reflections or contemptuous language. The passage ends with another series of exhortations. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Do you realize how many times in the New Testament there is an exhortation to be kind or forgiving or tender-hearted toward each other? In fact, if you start looking at them all over the place in various ways it's said, there's more said on that than there is on the Lord's Supper. Doesn't mean the Lord's Supper is not important, but there's certainly a weight, there's a lot of ink given in the New Testament to those exhortations. Paul mentioned six vices and contrast them with three virtues. We are commanded to be kind and for, a kind and forgiving people. We're not to harbor bitterness and malice. You see those things in your life. In areas where you have been sinned against, do you nurture rage and malice? Do you have the root of bitterness growing up within you? Sometimes it's not even when somebody sins against you, they just don't do what you want when you want it. If you see those things in your life, this is a call to repentance. Make it a matter of prayer before God. 
An old Arabian description captures the essence of friendship. It said, a friend is one with whom we can pour out the contents of our hearts, chaff and grain together, knowing that the gentlest of the hands will sift it, keeping what is worth keeping, and with a breath of kindness, blow the rest away. That's what should take place in our Christian relationships. Do you have that kind of attitude toward your fellow believers? Many times through the years I've received complaints from one Christian against another concerning something that was very trivial. One time I even received a call from somebody that said, you know, in Sunday school they looked at me funny. And that was the big concern that I was supposed to address. Well, do you need to repent in this area? Could be trivial, could not be. Now again, it's important to remember that these exhortations are written to redeemed people, to Christian people, those who have saving faith in Jesus. Maybe summarize the gospel in the idea that when we believe in Christ, truly we have saving faith, our sins are forgiven, and Christ's righteousness is imputed or credited to us, that we are truly justified by faith before Him. And if you're not in Christ, the exhortation of Scripture is to throw yourself upon Him, to trust in Him alone, to transfer trust in anything in yourself to Christ alone. And you enter into a state of grace before God, truly being justified before Him. If you are a redeemed person in Christ, think through this, these passages and how they speak to you as a believer and how you are to live, what is to be your demeanor, what is to characterize who you are as a redeemed child adopted into God's family. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the salvation we have through faith in Jesus, that we are truly accepted as righteous in your sight, not in any way because of our righteousness, but because of Christ's righteousness credited to us. We thank you that we can have the assurance of that salvation, knowing that we are truly forgiven and truly at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that we would be a people that increasingly characterize who we are as redeemed people adopted into your family. In Jesus' name.